me for a minute or two. Um, so uh, Neeraj uh, very ca uh, deeply cares about education and career guidance. He's been actively mentoring both individual students as well as educational institutions since 2010. Uh, students actually seek him for his resourceful insights into co college admissions as well as career planning. Uh, high schools seek him to structure their counseling departments and uh, college admission officers seek his insights into the education landscape in India. In 2014, his family established the Next Genius uh, Foundation, which is a charitable trust that offers full undergraduate scholarships at select US colleges to bright uh, grade 12 students from India. In 2017, his fund has actually awarded scholarships of worth about $6 million and continues to do a, a phenomenal job over the last uh, three, four years. Uh, every year, he attends several educational conferences across the world and visits college campuses abroad to keep himself updated with the latest trends. Uh, he was the first counselor from India to attend the prestigious Harvard Summer Institute on College Admissions. He is also a proud alumnus of UCLA and the University of Cambridge. So a warm welcome to you, Neeraj. Um, I'm sure that uh, the students here today will be delighted to hear from you firsthand on your account of uh, the education system here in India, how they need to kind of prepare uh, for courses in STEM. What is the STEM future really, right? And more importantly, how do you advise uh, all of them to kind of build up their careers in the STEM space? So over to you, Neeraj, and welcome once again. Thank you, Shekhar. It's, it's great to be here. Thank you for thinking of me and for that very gracious introduction. Uh, it's been one of the great pleasures of my life and very satisfying experience to work with students and teenagers in the last 10 years officially and last 19 years unofficially and mentor them as they make very important decisions about the direction in which they want to take their life, you know, because it's uh, easier to think about that when the ship is leaving the port, you know, and when the ship is midway onto some destination, it's harder to make a U-turn and change your direction. And it's been my experience that, you know, a lot of people, grown-ups in particular that I speak with, remain unsatisfied with their career. They're doing what they're doing because it's a job and it pays the bills. But when you ask them, uh, behind closed doors, behind closed curtains, that do you love what you do and are you extremely satisfied? Most people say no. So uh, my life is an effort to try to change that for the next generation of our children as they begin the transition from school onto college and from college onto what they wish to do in their life. And so it's, you know, I have looked at it from so many perspectives, like you mentioned, I looked at it from a counselor's perspective. I looked at it from the perspective of an international student myself, having been uh, in the undergraduate admissions office at my college, I looked at it from the admissions side. And now interestingly, you know, I also run the scholarship program. So I look at it from that perspective as well. And um, talking to students, parents, institutions across the country, across the world, it's, it's given me a fairly decent sense of, you know, the struggles that we are facing with education as the world changes around us. You know, the world is changing very fast. We all know this, we all recognize this. Uh, you spoke about STEM. STEM is very much the reason why the world is changing so fast around us. Technology is an enabler. Um, and I'm so happy to see this new education policy that last attempt was made 10 years ago. Now this government has made another attempt and put forward this NEP and um, on paper, in theory, sounds great. I'm very much curious to see how it actually unfolds uh, between now to 2040, which is the timeline that they have set for themselves. And uh, now to 2040 is also a very interesting time because the students that I have been told are attending today are very young. They are teens and pre-teens. So uh, just correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the age group of eight-year-old to 16-year-old. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. And so, you have two parents also. Yeah. So, I mean, these students, um, you know, it's we, they're in such an impressionable age, right? We were all that age. We were such impressionable young people. And they listen to everybody, they listen to the media around them, they look at their friends around them, and they form their opinions. And I'm today here to add to that impression and add a new shade to that.
because I want to remind all of them that you know whatever they see today and whatever they hear today, their careers are not today. And whatever they feel that, okay, this is hot or that field is really great and it's got potential, uh, you know, there is a chance for glory in a certain career right now. What they need to think is that I'm going to be joining that field in 10 to 15 years from today. You know, if a student is eight year old or 10 year old today, they're probably going to join their career somewhere by the time they are 23, 25, you know. So 20, 35, they have to think about what the world will look like in 2035, not in 2020. They don't have to make their decisions on the basis of 2020. And that is where this new education policy excites me because it, you know, in India, we always had this I model of education, which is you decide in grade 10 the direction and the one street that you're going to go down, right? We are so much pigeonholed in our vision for how we approach education. And it was a great uh, gift from the British, obviously. And they also do their admissions like this. They did it forever. Um, you know, asking a grade 10 person, whether you are a science person or a commerce person or a arts person or a humanities person and expecting them to know everything about the world and make that decision which has such a big impact on their life. Uh, it, it loses so many opportunities for them. And slowly we seem to be moving away from that I model of education to capital I, small I, which is what our new education policy is telling us that if you are a, a physics major and you're doing a degree in physics and suddenly if you feel that you are interested in drama, maybe you will be able to combine that as a minor along with your degree and also it's made it more credit oriented so uh, it's likely going to be more flexible yet at the same time i feel there is even more potential because there is another model out there of education in the world primarily in the us which is what they call the pie model of education which is that you enter college undecided you don't you can always say that i prefer x y and z but very frequently students are encouraged to enter college and a college that offers so many subjects undecided. So that is the, the top line of the pie. And then as you explore many subjects in the first year, in the second year of your degree, you then carefully choose one area which excites you after having tasted it. So kind of like a, a buffet model of education, if you may, that this is my main course and this is my side dish. And I experienced everything first. So that pie model of education. Because what we are seeing more and more in this world is that the interface overlaps. These people who say that, well, I know a little bit about X and I know a little bit about Y. And I, I know a lot about the interface between the two. They seem to be doing better. And why do they seem to be doing better? It's because of a very simple trend in our world, which is predictability and automation. So there was this interesting study done at Oxford a few years ago where uh, they, they predicted that, you know, in the next couple of decades, 50% of the jobs in the world will be gone. I'm sure all of you have heard about it. Uh, and it was kind of mind numbing and shocking for everybody that is this really going to happen? And uh, is, is automation and artificial intelligence really our enemy? Is it going to take away all the jobs? Um, obviously, our emotional reaction first is that of fear because anything that is uncertain, we struggle with. But then as you think more about it, you start realizing that this world is run by economics you know, and efficiency. And businesses and organizations in the world likes efficiency. And if I can do something that will better my offering, make me more competitive and reduce my price as a business, that's the direction I'm going to take. And if that means cutting jobs, replacing them with robots, using artificial intelligence, using data analytics in an interesting way, then so be it, you know? And, and that is what we are seeing in this world. And, uh, there is so much political tension in the world today. We are talking about going from globalization to deglobalization. At the fundamental core of it lies the economics that STEM is changing the nature of work. 
So what needed 500 people to manufacture one Mercedes Benz a century ago, today can be done by 20 robots. And then to manage those robots, we need maybe three other people and one dog to keep those three other people busy and stopping them from interfering with the machinery, right? We've all heard that joke that uh, the factory of the future has three people in it, 500 machines in it, and one dog, the dog is to stop the people from touching the machines, right? Uh, so STEM is only going to be catalyzed as we go as we go forward into the world, especially in this COVID-19 world and the post-COVID-19 world. The last time such a thing happened, 100 years ago, we had limited technology. Today, we have the internet, media, communications, technology. Uh, the world has not come to a stop the way it did 100 years ago when the Spanish flu hit. And many things are still being offered and it's thanks to automation, the internet, and post-COVID, it is only going to increase. So for those of you who are interested in STEM, you know, today the audience is very STEM heavy. I love talking to this audience. You are in it, you are, you know, you are going to have um, great opportunities coming your way, okay? Worry not about automation taking your jobs away. Because as a panacea to automation, there is innovation. And there is always this great seesaw that is happening in the world. Every time there is automation in this world, innovation kicks in and new things come in the world. Things that we could not see previously. So imagine hundreds of centuries ago, uh, our ancestors were farmers and rural dwellers. And if you told them that your grandchildren, great, great grandchildren are going to become software engineers, they would have said, well, maybe they should learn to plow the field, you know, because that is the job of the day. And that is what is going to be lucrative. But what happens is automation kicks in, it removes the need for us to work and frees us up as people to pursue newer opportunities. So those of you who are thinking of fighting automation, my suggestion to you is don't. Think of innovation. And there are so many things that you can think of when it comes to the newer age careers in terms of innovation that, you know, you don't need to worry that, oh my God, if I become an engineer, will there be jobs for an engineer tomorrow? Think smartly about, well, what will people need when all of this stuff that is being manufactured today is going to be done in a completely automated manner with the use of robots, and the internet of things and the internet, you know, listen, guys, I, I love to eat pizza. Okay. And, and when I was a kid, the, you had to go to the pizza store and order it and wait outside or eat over there. Then came the dial in, right? You could just dial in because we had phones and they had phones and they had systems and they, I had become a member. And then, you know, the dominoes happened and then it went online. You know, I could go to a website and I could just punch in my preferences. I could even customize my pizza the way I wanted. I could find out if it was available or not. I also knew that, you know, in 30 minutes, it will reach my house, this customized pizza. Then came the apps and technology changed everything again. And, and guess what? Tomorrow, something new is going to come along as well, where it's not just the internet of our computers and cell phones, but it's the internet of everything, all the machines, all the electronics of this world and the non-electronic stuff is also connected to it, right? So uh, if, if Google was a revolutionary website and you thought that this is it and nothing else is going to come, you are in for a big surprise because another new website is going to come, another new technology is going to come that will digitally connect everything around us. So um, if you're interested in engineering, definitely there are some fantastic opportunities waiting for you in robotics, in the internet of things, uh, in virtual reality, because, and I believe that uh, Shekhar, you had somebody come and speak about virtual reality. So, yes. you know, how we interact with uh, digital machines, with computing interfaces, it's, it's totally about to change, you know, the moment we go into this virtual reality world. And uh, today we think of virtual reality more in terms of uh, maybe for games or entertainment, or, uh, but at the same time, you know, US uh, military and other militaries are using them for surveillance and 
and managing all their drones. Tomorrow we will use it for stronger communication. Today we are on this sort of 2D platform where I see you on the screen and you see me on the screen and tomorrow it will be as if we are sitting in front of each other. Um, we are going to be using it for education. So imagine how that will change the landscape of the real world, right? Internet penetration changed the real world and virtual reality combined with artificial intelligence, Internet of uh, Things is going to dramatically change the efficiency with which we work. And those who are going to be extremely conservative and stick to the well-known things, they are going to have to battle automation. And those who are going to think uh, you know, out of, the, out of the box and try to become overlap experts where the artificial intelligence is not that strongly defined, right? Uh, okay, something interesting is happening here. Uh, okay, yeah. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. So, you know, maybe there is an interesting connect between music and physics. And the student that says, I'm interested in music and physics, they are probably going to come up with something very interesting, which we don't know what it is yet. You know, um, our understanding of heat, electricity, mechanics seems to be better, better than our understanding of sound, light, and magnetism. So, you know, those of us who say, yes, I'm interested in music and I'm interested in physics are probably going to build some very interesting technology in the future, which we can't even envision today, you know. So I would very much encourage students to start thinking about these interesting overlaps uh, that excite them and not to worry about, oh, what am I going to do with this tomorrow? What you need to worry about more is, well, I'm doing this conventional thing. It's probably going to get automated because the moment we understand how a system is defined and we understand the vast parameters within it and how they are related to each other, we automate it. It's as simple as that. And we automate it by hard coding it. And now with the rise of artificial intelligence, that artificial intelligence is itself going to automate other things. Okay. So my, my simple message to those who are thinking of this field is the more fuzzy something is, the more obscure and more less understood the, the less understood something is, the better your prospects are because there is going to be great scope for innovation. Okay. So, uh, you know, perhaps that's maybe a little bit theoretical for the younger kids, but I hope the parents who are listening in will, uh, will benefit from those insights. Um, so I spoke about robotics. I spoke about IOT. I spoke about AI. Um, Data science is another field that I would encourage a lot of students who are particularly who are less hardware oriented and more software oriented. It seems to be the hottest field right now. And going forward, um, somewhere I read that we as humanity have generated more data in the last two or three years than we did in all of human civilization and society. So isn't that interesting? Because with so much data pouring in, they say that data is the new gold and, you know, understanding data, classifying data, finding trends in data, spotting things that we were not able to uh, spot before, enhancing efficiency, identifying opportunity. This really seems to be a game that is increasing very strongly. And, um, you know, science has always been pro data and, uh, Humanities and design have always appealed more to our aesthetic sense, our subjective understanding of things, our qualitative understanding of things. And they have struggled to quantify things always. But now with data pouring in, even I would say the entire field of humanities is being driven towards a very quantitative manner. Okay, So to give you a simple example, the ads that you see on Instagram, it is a complete result of this field of data science because they are understanding your behavior and then 
pushing forward those ads which you are more likely to be interested in you are more likely to click on right so this is a this is a fantastic example of data science already in play so data science is another one of those things that you know students who are interested in math or interested in computer science i would very strongly encourage them not just to look at computer science as a major but data science in particular now you you know suppose you've done a degree in data science where do you go you know do you, do you go and work as a scientist assisting other scientists in analyzing data do you go and work in a business helping that business uh, find efficiency do you go work uh, in the financial sector in banking and insurance and helping them map out their data all of the above or or do you go and uh, work with nasa and map out the stars that also right look for uh, exoplanets and aliens that also so data science is so it's becoming so ubiquitous the way that computer science has changed the landscape data science is coming and it is going to change our la our landscape again and provide a lot of interesting insights um, i spoke briefly about data science and i gave you that example of uh, instagram and facebook and social medias and how they are studying you you are the product um, that then leads us on to another field of cyber security you know in this world where everything is becoming digital it's very important to have security so again those of you who are interested in computer science uh those of you who are more risk conscious individuals you know there are great opportunities for you in cyber security Al already we are seeing the rise in cyber attacks right if you following the news there are so many international cyber attacks happening on governments on organizations on businesses um we even heard the, the news that you know russian hackers chinese hackers etc are trying to steal covid research from the us uh, and other places australia says that chinese hackers are attacking them so in a world where this life of ours is increasingly becoming digital you know putting a lock on your door putting a lock on your computer and only you having access to it is becoming so important so that's another field i would encourage all the young students to research um and and there are some fantastic opportunities in cyber security from a very early point if you have realized that that excites you um uh, obviously for those who are going to study in the us you don't need to decide on day one you can always uh, try it out before you decide talking about data science um cyber security and everything becoming digital also then leads me to fintech because increasingly what is money we all have to ask the question um in the olden days people used to keep gold and stacks of cash at home i think those days are fast disappearing although maybe gold has come back in covid 19 um but more and more i don't find myself going to the bank you know more and more i am finding myself uh, going on the app or on the website uh and also thinking about investing in cryptocurrencies so then you know there is such a we are in the early days of fintech right fintech is this field which combines technology with finance so you have to ask yourself what is money at the end of the day because perhaps in the future money is going to be linked more strongly to human effort through cryptocurrencies and the entire banking insurance financial sector infrastructure is increasingly going to be driven by programs and code um and and devices which are interesting so if you are somebody who says well i like business and i like uh, technology and i like thinking about money then maybe fintech is a very good field for you to explore all right so again it goes on to exemplify that it's this overlap experts okay this the people who say well i like business and finance and i like computer science and the overlap of the two and the rise of fintech in its early days it's is another classic example of that overlap expert um and the rise of them um another thing you know I, I, we always talk about stem and and we think about engineering and we think about computer science right but uh, i i briefly alluded to the humanities a few moments ago and i feel that that's going to be another very interesting 
kind of person for the future, what we call the fuzzy and the techie. So the techie is the person who says, I like math, I like STEM, you know, um, I like the sciences. And the fuzzy is the person who says, well, I'm very curious about how human beings live and work and the decisions they make and how they make decisions and what they think is right. So uh, that's always been a fuzzy field because it's been harder to quantify, right? So, and I spoke about how data science is changing that field. Um, so those of you who find yourself to be equally interested in the techie side, as well as the fuzzy side, I would say you are in for some fantastic opportunities here as well. Uh, there have been so many arguments made by intellectuals and professors that you know had Mark Zuckerberg been a psych major and a CS minor, Facebook would have looked very different. And the way Facebook interacts with the world and its impact on the world would have been very different. Um, you know, he's the king of social media. Every new social media he gobbles up. So the world would have looked very different. And perhaps in the future, there will be somebody who will come along and who will be stronger on the fuzzy side and, and slightly weaker on the techie side, but then has these new perspectives on human emotions and human behavior and how society makes decisions. So for those of you who are interested in things like psychology, sociology, politics, linguistics, I would strongly encourage you, and, and, and you say, well, I like math and I like computer science. I would strongly encourage you to think about the double major rather than just the one STEM major. Okay? We, in India, there is always this notion, we have this hangover, that if you are the smart kid, you have the good grades, then you have to go into science and particularly into engineering. And that's the game. Otherwise, go for medicine. And if you are not so bright, maybe, you know, average kid, maybe you're going into the commerce and business, etc. And if you are really a duffer, then you're going into arts, you know. But I think those days are changing. And thanks so much to Three Idiots for bringing that into the mass consciousness of our country. Uh, and I, I always find the, the younger parents and perhaps those parents of those eight-year-olds are much more switched on to, you know, how this world is changing. And, and they are very conscious uh, about what their children are going to do and what will be a, a good direction for them. So look carefully at your children. You know, if you find them to have this streak and curiosity about not just machines and programs, but also human beings. And if you find them asking interesting questions about how we are making decisions uh, as people, you know, not just our minds, but also our heart, then I can tell you there are some fantastic opportunities waiting for you at the interface of humanity and technology, the fuzzy and the techie, you know. Um, a lot of small liberal arts colleges in the US particularly do a very good job of this. Uh, you know, everybody in India I talk to who's very STEM oriented loves to go to MIT and loves to go to uh, Stanford, you know, always the dream schools like Carnegie Mellon, etc. But they, they so frequently overlook schools like Amherst College and Pomona, which are doing an equally good job of teaching you technology as well as humanities, right? And because of that smaller classrooms and being able to uh, engage with professors from different backgrounds, I find that I'm doing a very good job. And it's the new age liberal arts colleges here in India, like your Ashoka and Symbiosis and Flame and Ahmedabad University, uh, et cetera, who are, who are now gearing up to look like that. So I'm, I'm very happy that these winds of change are blowing in India. And, uh, you know, you don't necessarily all have to jump to give the IIT, JD and the PITSAT and everything else. Please stand back and look at the new age opportunities that are coming up. You know, anyways, most of the people who go into engineering and the IITs, etc., leave it and then move into something else. We, we know that 70% of the engineers, two, two to three out of four uh, of the engineers are leaving it. And then going into something else later, whether it's management or banking or uh, even in uh, random cases, I have seen law as well. So by default, our setting is engineering, which is very much a hangover from our previous generations and, and uh, uh, our desire to build this country once the British left. But as we look at the 21st century, we are, we are going to have to build it in very interesting ways, you know, and I can see that, you know, China as compared to India is already doing a very good job, although, and, and probably I'm going to be a very controversial person to, you know, praise the Chinese today, but uh, 
see take away the whole control of the chinese society from out of the hands of the communist party they have they have done a much better job of engaging with artificial intelligence and iot and combining it then even the us if there is a very interesting uh, book called ai wars which i would encourage all of you to read and there is much that we can learn in india from the way the chinese have engaged with these technologies now obviously their intention has is not something that i hope that we copy but i believe the intensity with which they recognize the potential of these technology and the speed with which they execute it i hope we are able to learn in india and, and roll out in a similar way in the next coming decades so that then brings me to another interesting point about ethics and philosophy right because very much in my mind the moment china comes ethics and philosophy always comes in uh, and that is going to be another one of those humanities factors that we have to think very carefully about when artificial intelligence is given birth to by us as people and artificial intelligence has the kind of power that we envision it to have are we also then going to code ethics into it and if we are going to code ethics and morality and a sense of what is right and wrong who's right and wrong my right and wrong uh another person's right and wrong another religion's right and wrong another geography's right and wrong who's right and wrong so there is going to be this massive debate in our society as we go down this ai route further as to who should have the power and what should ai believe to be right and wrong so those of you and i always find stem kids are very good at philosophy right uh, it's just that we don't encourage them to think about it okay uh, the way their brains are wired the real stem kids they are always naturally drawn to the big questions of this world who are we what are we doing here what is the purpose what is right what is wrong uh, they are very strong abstract thinkers and if if you find yourself attracted to such questions please don't ignore them combine them with your technology because there are going to be some great opportunities for you i have a student who is studying currently comparative religion at college and she just got hired by microsoft because for this question that what is right and what is wrong and she is in that team with other humanities people who are engaging with the team of tech people that we have to teach our ai what is right and what is wrong um, i think all of you might have seen that movie called i robot um, where um, will smith is there and that child is there and that accident is about to happen and the robot jumps and saves the wrong person and he always has this uh, a uh, pain in his life because of it um so same thing as as we are now going to move into an era where we have electrical cars and self driven cars and when that situation comes up again and there is a 20% chance of saving a child and 70% chance of saving the driver who should be safe that's so i think for those of you who are interested in philosophy ethics please pursue that do not leave that behind whether you do it in the classroom or you do it outside this is going to be a very big debate of society who should have the power over your privacy should it be a large technology companies or should it be your government or should it be you yourself we have two models in the world one with china and its surveillance mechanism and the other with social media and their surveillance mechanism who is right who is wrong these are very big questions and and, and in a world where we are all increasingly living a digital life and living a digital footprint these questions need to be answered because a uh, any government that has the power then will abuse it and b any corporation that has that power will abuse it and we see that happening today and in the future i hope that the power then shifts to the hand of the citizen itself but it's not going to be given just like that you know so that's another field uh, talking about ethics philosophy then also makes me think about future careers outside of this engineering and cs and thinking about biotechnology because it's the very silent wave that is coming you know while we can physically see the cell phones and the airbnbs and the ubers and ai in front of us you don't see so much of the biotech revolution that is happening all around you randomly tidbits of news will show up that you know oh they could uh, grow uh, a year on a mouse's back and maybe we can you know Uh, substitute a human ear in the case when their surgery needs to be done, or we just clone a liver. You know, we can take your cells and we can 
you're on a liver and then if you're an alcoholic, then maybe we can change your liver later. Or uh, we just cloned a sheep, you know, maybe we can clone human embryos in the future. So, uh, or, uh, you know, uh, things like uh, designer babies. And, you know, we see a rise of synthetic biology now. We are we're starting to get a good sense of uh, the software of life, the DNA, the epigenetics of it. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised that in the next few decades, we very much have the technology to do big things that as lay people, we are shocked. What is really holding it back is the regulation. It's the regulation that is GM crop okay to grow or not okay to grow. So, you know, opportunities in philosophy, law, and how they relate to technology, both in the digital sense and in the biological sense. We are, there are some great opportunities there, right? Uh, for those of you who are interested in things like this, maybe even consider becoming patent lawyers. You know, these people get paid very handsomely and there's always a, a minority of them. So if you find yourself interested in law as well as technology, that can be another very lucrative career for you. If you find yourself curious by biology and, and curious about viruses and bacteria and fungi and simple organisms and vertebrates and plants and human biology, I very much encourage you to think about biology, genetics, biochemistry, because the era of synthetic biology is upon us. We are going to be using it in everything from changing the efficiency of crops to 3D printing burgers to, you know, 3D printing organs on demand to uh, tweaking the hair color for our children, etc., etc. I mean, the future is full of science fiction. What our past science fiction books told us, the future is very much that, you know, we have the technology. We are almost at the cusp of it. We are just being held back by regulation and uh, the social moral debate around it. Uh, please pursue this. There are some outstanding opportunities, not just to get jobs, but also uh, for technology entrepreneurs, you know, to set up shop. So those of you who are entrepreneurial and like biology, there are, like I can tell you, in, in this country itself, you don't necessarily have to go abroad and think India, India is doing a very good job of biology. Um, silently. Okay, so it's the silent revolution that is happening all around us. Uh, I have to ask Shekhar how much time I have because you know this is something I can talk for hours. <laughs> yeah, I don't need it. You've got another five minutes and there are questions pouring in like anything. Right? Okay, so, all right. A lot of those questions are real pertinent questions. So, Sure. So uh, let me just take a sip and gather my thoughts. Another field, you know, as I shift gears and I realize I have five minutes, I want to all of you to think about is chemistry. You know, I, I find very few kids going to chemistry. And guys, the way we have understood physics and math and the way we have been able to use that to build machines and the internet and everything else that is coming and the way we have understood biology from the core and now we are entering the synthetic era of biology, I can tell you, we are there with chemistry and, and in the next few decades, you will see a big boom of synthetic materials and they will change everything. And there will even be an overlap of biology with chemistry as we address this challenge of sustainability. We've messed up this earth, we've polluted it to no end, we continue to do it. Uh, and we treat it as if, you know, not my problem. Our children, children's children are definitely going to have to pay for it. And the way most likely they are going to solve it is through biology and nanomaterials. Plastic was such a big revolution in the last century. Cleaning up that plastic is going to be the big revolution of this century, right? I always have these uh, children who say, oh, I went to, uh, because I live in Bombay, Mumbai, uh, they go to Juhu Beach, they clean up the Juhu Beach and they come back, you know, very proud. I have cleaned the beach. But then when I asked them, so what did you do with the plastic? Oh, I just threw it in the corner, you know, because they don't have the answer to what to finally do with the plastic, right? Because that plastic will then get thrown in a dump, which will then again enter the sea. 
So what is your effort for ultimately, right? Temporary resolution and uh, false sense of pride that I clean the beach. Ultimately, you have to figure out how to get rid of this plastic. So nanotechnology, new age materials, biotechnology is not just going to help us um, come up with newer technologies. It's going to help us solve this mess that we have created in the last 100, 150 years. I think the renewable energy, everybody knows. I, I don't think I need to talk about that. Uh, perhaps I can allude to other interesting things, you know, uh, water purification. A coconut plant does a better job of it than we as humans do. You put a coconut plant next to a beach and you have beautiful, uh, sweet, clean coconut water. And guess where that came from? It came from the ocean. It desalinated that water. We are going to face water wars in the future. Already we can see the fight for Tibet is about water. Who is going to control Tibet is going to control the waters, is going to have this civilization is all about water, by the way. So uh, people who have desalination technologies are going to do better in the future. Arabs have oil, they burn it. They have a shortage of water, so they are able to do desalination. We have no such oil. We'll have to use our brain and do it. So uh, biotechnology for water purification, for plastic, for novel materials, for energy, for computing, for reforestation, uh, for mining, clean mining, uh, for garbage disposal, a lot of opportunities in this space of chemistry, sustainability, and biology. You know, always, and, and I face this as well. I went to medical school for a week before I finally decided I don't want to be a doctor. Uh, although I did end up <laughs> becoming one in the end. Uh, because my mother simply said, well, if you like biology, go be a doctor. And that I find that to be so uh, common, you know, that if you like biology, go be a doctor or a dentist or something. But please, there is so much more coming in this future of biology and environmental and sustainability. Um, two quick things I want to refer to before I stop, Shikhar. One is we are going to the space. It's very simple. We are going to the moon and we are going to Mars. We are already on a long-term trajectory. Uh, everything that the governments are doing, everything people like Elon Musk are doing, we are going to be a bioplanetary species. So for those of you who are interested in space, don't hold back. There are a lot of interesting opportunities as automation kicks on this earth, there will be more jobs in space, whether it is uh, becoming an astronaut and a pilot or an exobiologist, or it is going to be how to become an architect uh, or a farmer or a miner in space and on other planets. I highly, or it's going to be somebody who, uh, you know, charts the sky and navigates insurance, watching out for asteroids. There is a whole new chapter of human civilization opening up and there are going to be some mind blowing opportunities. They say the next trillionaire is going to be made in the space industry, not here on earth, okay? So for those of you who are very much uh, money oriented, look outside, don't look here, okay? Don't look at starting the next Amazon. Think of starting the next colony on Mars. Uh, and the second thing I want to briefly, very briefly touch on is understanding our mind. The most complex machine in the world is the mind. Uh, it is more complicated than the universe. And this century we are on a very fast track to understanding how our mind works. We have better technology to tinker around with it and look inside in it. And I believe that once we have a basic enough sense, we are going to fuse the biology with the silicon, okay? And somehow we will have very interesting technologies. Uh, you know, today I have to put on the visors to go into VR, right? Maybe in the future I won't have to because I might have an interesting node or a chip or something. Or even more bizarre uh, futuristic things. If you're interested in psychology and biology, I can again tell you there are going to be interesting opportunities to address all sorts of issues from uh, learning difficulties to decision making, to mental imbalance, to connecting the brain to the digital realm. So that is one last thing I wanted to touch on. Uh, like I said, Shekhar, I can spend six hours talking, but I think that's where I will stop. My, my final parting message to all of you is 
don't look outside look inside it's very easy to look outside and get fascinated by everything the success i find those people who look inside and focus on who they are and align what they do with who they are and their natural talents abilities personalities values live a more happy satisfying and a successful life so that's the message i want to leave all the children with look within to find what you have to do outside so thank you so much for having me shekhar and i apologize for exceeding my time no neeraj it was simply awesome i think uh, you know you've mesmerized us completely with so many different options right uh, typically everyone feels that stem is all about engineering math physics but i think bringing in the elements of chemistry outer space astrophysics and you know all of those combinations i think that's pretty interesting and i was uh, very surprised to hear about humanities and your take on that right and how it's going to impact our future world uh, that was a complete eye opener for me personally at least so a couple of questions we've got a few children also who are above grade uh, who are in you know 16 years and stuff like that so they've been posting some questions any tips or suggestions that you think that how can they prepare for their undergrad programs right how do you think a few top things that you think that universities actually look for when these kids actually apply for undergrad programs yeah this is i always get this question right because of the nature of my work and this is one of those sort of million dollar questions yeah, how do i prepare and <laughs> the thing the problem with answering that question is uh, the i is different for every individual so uh, to give you some general tips um, because i'm a big believer in personalization of education and not giving broad answers like this but there are something that all of us need to do now do those think more about yourself don't think of this answer as a panacea to college admissions okay so the broad things that you must all be doing is number one knowing yourself right and this is shameless self promotion obviously go to counselors like me and please do sophisticated aptitude testing we are at a point where we have some very sophisticated tools at our use to help you get to know yourself and to help you avoid making mistakes right i always find myself much more satisfied after a meeting when i have helped a student avoid going into the field which is not in line with their mind right it's harder to help them choose the right thing it's more important to help them eliminate the thing which is not in line with them so know yourself which was my last message as well and so try to get a sense of yourself in terms of a what is it that you do better than other people what are your natural talents and abilities you know that that come to you without trying in an innate manner number 2 try to build skills interesting skills uh, i always love this idea of 10000 hours when you do something for 10000 hours you become a master of it and obviously that can't be done in a couple of years just before going to college but embark in that direction maybe you can continue in that direction at college try to identify a couple of areas where you have superior skills you know you you are a, a a coder become a superior coder you are a an archer become a superior archer so go for excellence in a handful of skills don't go broad go deep with skill building okay obviously you might want to explore a couple many things but ultimately the great colleges of the world are not looking for breadth they're looking for depth okay so you can't have depth in so many areas right you can't be a master of all you have to be a master of some identify try to identify yourself who you are your talents and try to identify your skills early and from maybe 9 and 10 start working on them and going deeper it's the second message third thing is you should be curious you know the best students are the ones who are interested in learning not interested in getting into that that college you know so what are you curious about list it all out and start reading reading widely i find so only a minority of the kids do you know in a world which is uh, full of social media and screen time it's taking away our book time and reading is so fundamental you know in india when somebody is educated we call them padha likha so if you don't know how to do padhna how will you do the likhna and how will we call you educated it's it's fantastic that we have a army of educated people who are 
illiterate when it comes to critical reading as adults. Therefore, the state of the country. So read, please, and read widely. I lead you to one, two books in today's webinar itself. Uh, if you go follow me on Instagram, almost every week I'm putting books, you know, that read this, read this. So start reading. Next thing I would say is that uh, try to get a sense for your attitude, your fears, and how your family has shaped you and your perspective. And try to realize that the world will, is full of people who have perspectives that are different from you. And what is it that has shaped you to have a certain perspective and how much of it is you and how much of it is your environment? People who are very really alert to that, not only do a good job of the application, they do a good job of college. Uh, so maturity in a, in a short word. Number one, uh, after that, I would say, whatever you do, get good grades, please. Because ultimately, you know, speaking as much as we all speak about holistic admissions, it begins with the numbers. So we are looking at your school grades. We are looking at your test grades. And, you know, in, in my younger years, I always used to think, and as somebody who took the SAT myself, I thought, oh, I hate this test, right? Everybody doesn't like it. Very, very rarely do I see a kid who says, I love the SAT, or I love the IIT JE. It's, it's a means to an end. But I think now with more years, I have realized that it's a necessary evil. It doesn't define you. It is just a tool to help you get into college. So we have no better way of deciding who to accept into college and who not to accept. And in the absence of a better tool, this is the best tool we have. So please don't take it to heart but do a good job in all your testing and school grades. The next thing I would say is build good relationship with your teachers. This is very important because these are the people who are going to write you recommendation letters and more and more colleges in the world, including in India, are looking at recommendation letters from teachers. So build strong, meaningful relationship with your teachers. Um, Two more points I have. Number one is team play and leadership. You have to learn how to navigate in both the boats. The best colleges of the world are looking for people who can play in both sides. They can become very good team players when needed and they can become very good leaders when they are needed. And the last point I have is, and, and I always find in India, the moment I say it, everybody starts thinking, oh, I have to go help the underprivileged. It's not community service, it's community engagement. So think of people around you and how can you engage with them in a meaningful manner? Because I always get bombarded with, okay, I have to go help the aged, the blind, the poor, you know? Not necessarily. And if you genuinely feel for those populations, please go into it. But focus on something that you genuinely uh, find yourself driven towards. So if it's teaching English, to uh, the helper at your home, please do that. And you might realize that there is a very large subset of people, you know, and you can help them improve language skills. And maybe the other way around as well, maybe my children need to learn Marathi better from them. So any kind of interesting community engagement, please embark on that. So that's a very long answer to a very short question. No, that's fantastic, uh, Neeraj. And I think uh, each word that you actually mentioned means a lot because I think uh, that's what we need our kids to kind of, uh, you know, prepare for, even from a generalistic perspective. You know, I think that they need to kind of invite some of these values. Another question, uh, this is a kid, uh, Arjav, who's asking you is, uh, what's the fallback option in India for kids who are preparing for JE? If you could name some colleges in India offering promising courses in data sciences and AI. Okay. So, um, you know, this is where I'll have to promote a few colleges over the others, which I feel uncomfortable doing. So I'm happy if he reaches out directly to me and if I could have a one-to-one -one conversation, if you don't mind. Sure, absolutely. We could do that. Uh, another question for you is uh, uh, quantum physics. Is this a good uh, future career? Fantastic career. The next set of computing is either going to be quantum computing or biological computing. So we are all waiting. The moment we have a quantum computer and Google claims to have made it and there's a whole population that says this is not possible. Um, 
cyber security and everything else will simply fail, right? The, the quantum computer is going to be so fast that it will simply decode everything else that exists today. So anybody who says they are interested in quantum physics, I, I, I would highly encourage you to look at that. There are going to be great applications of it. Computing is only one of them. Okay? There might be even more applications above and beyond computing. Uh, I know you mentioned about space engineering. Um, so, you know, the question is, is space engineering a fuzzy and techy career? So is it a mix of two or it's pure engineering? How would yeah, you I, love, I love that question. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like saying, is the software interest industry a fuzzy career or a techy career? Because space is going to be a frontier that we capture not just by one set of people, but I, by a barrage and army of people who have specialist skills. We are going to need people who know how to fly. We are going to need people who know how to build. We are going to need people who know how to navigate. We are going to need people who know how to take care of our biological and mental health while we are in space. So I, I feel it is going to be a combination. You know, it depends on what role you want to play within this industry. Um, great question. I, I love it. And I, this person who is asking, great, your mind is very much switched on. Congratulations. Go and explore. Please go on the net. You have the net, you know. We didn't have the net when we were kids. So that was for Jivitesh. Uh, great job, Jivitesh. Uh, one more question. Uh, what is a career option for someone interested in literature, design, and sustainability? Study options in India. Yeah. Um, together or separately? Um, I would think probably it would be a mix of everything. It's together. Languages, sustainability, and what was the third thing you said? A literature, design, sustainability. Design. Yeah. So to me, this is what I call a specialist question, right? This is a kid who has gone into such a strong niche from a, such a young age. My first feedback to them is be very careful because niche can be a very good thing and niche can be a very dangerous place. You can get stuck in a niche, but a person, and once you get stuck in a niche, it's very hard to change, okay? Uh, so if, if you are a person in a very early age thinking I'm interested in these three things and I want to connect the, these three things, my suggestion to you first is go broad. Okay, first I'll go a little bit broad because these are widely different things and the role that will come out at the overlap of these three things, we probably can't predict today. So you might go in media, okay, you might go in data science, Okay, you might go in software, you might go uh, in how machines communicate with each other and the environment and people. I think it's a very big unknown space. My feedback to this person is, don't decide this today. Keep exploring all three. And if you can do a degree where you are able to study all three, keep exploring them and finally specialize once you've finished your undergraduate degree and maybe you're thinking of your graduate school and you've got some experience in the field, okay? Do not go so niche so early. Thanks for that. Um, I think there's one more question, uh, which we will take on is, um, uh, is, are there any good options in the aviation industry? What's the future of aviation? So there's always a shortage of pilots. And uh, you always find uh, this is a career which is, not very sort of study oriented, but much more practical and experience oriented. So if you are interested in becoming a pilot with an airline, cargo, you are never going to be out of a job. There's always a shortage of pilots in this world. Secondly, I think drone operators, you know, although they are not very much mainstream, but in the future, as we start moving goods, through drones and other means, I think there are going to be interesting opportunities there. I think there are even interesting opportunities in the defense services for somebody who says, I'm into aviation. There are interesting opportunities in the space industry, you know, for somebody who says, I'm interested in aviation. Of course, you could always go in research as well, but then the practical application uh, 
you're a, you're a pilot. You know, you're going to engage with all the modes that are flying and sailing through the seas. So I, I don't see these people ever out of a job. There's always a shortage of them. Even, even with the technology kicking in, right? We always think that, okay, the car is going to be completely driverless. Well, when it's a low ticket item, such as we are moving goods from place X to Y, maybe they might not be. But when there's a high ticket item, for example, us as human beings and your and my children, we will never be completely comfortable in the next couple of generations with complete autopilot. So there will always be a person who uses technology as an aid in order to fly. So there's always a burning question out there, Neeraj, in terms of uh, overseas education versus Indian education, right? For any of the fields that you've mentioned, right? What should one consider while either going for overseas or for Indian education? Yeah, this is a great question. I love this question. It's in fact one I ask the students who come to visit me often why abroad? Because somewhere, you know, I'm teasing them. You want to go only because your friends are going. Uh, and I'm trying to see, you know, if they, if they really genuinely are interested in benefiting from this experience. So I, I have a, a traffic light system that I have developed over the years for this. Red, yellow, green. And there are three parameters I tell all my families to look at. Number one is academics. That the student, are they doing okay? Are they doing really well? Or are they struggling? Because if they are struggling, you know, be very careful. That's a red light for me. Because they are going to struggle, they're struggling here. Now you are talking about sending them to another country where there are no tuition teachers like India. And, you know, they are going to have to do everything independently. They are going to struggle over there as well. Okay. So if you think your son or daughter is doing relatively okay, academically speaking, and in line with what they want to study, that's a yellow or a green light. If you see them struggling here and you're thinking, yeah, yeah I'll send them to London or Canada or US, Singapore, think again. Because that's a recipe for disaster. You know, what will happen is they will go there, they will struggle, it will hit, it will hit their self-confidence. And once it hits the self-confidence, you know, that's a slippery slope to many other personal and social problems. So that's the first parameter that every family should look at. The second parameter that every family should look at is the maturity and emotional strength of the child as well as the parents. Many a times I see that the kid is very much emotionally ready and mature and is able to handle themselves and able to identify toxic relationships from healthy relationships and able to make independent decisions and take care of them and other people around them. But the parents are struggling. You know, many a times I see the mothers coming in and saying, uh, all this is fine, you do all, but you give me one option in India, mera man nahi hua to baad mein nahi you know? So... Uh, you have to look at the emotional intelligence on both sides. Is the child independent and mature? And are the parents themselves ready? So, uh, not ready, not, not struggling, you know, struggling to clean your room, struggling to, uh, you know, socialize and identify negative influences, totally dependent on parents, helpers, siblings, you are not emotionally ready. So better work on that before you even think of going abroad because suddenly you are going to be orphaned in another country. You are going to have to do your laundry, dishes, cook, take care of yourself, your belongings, safety, security, you know, while you are studying, pursuing to build your resume, having fun at college. So this is a second very important parameter. The third parameter is obviously the cost, right? College abroad is a very expensive affair. It can cost you anything from 40-50 lakhs to 2 CR plus, depending on the country and the course and the scholarship that you're getting. Very rarely do I see a student going at less than 40 lakh for the entire duration of the undergrad, right? Probably they're going to uh, a European country um, with a very low um, fee structure. Even then, the living cost is very high in Europe. Or they are going to the US to some completely all expenses paid scholarship that pays for your tuition as well as the living. Um, so parents who have not financially planned for it or who have only partially planned for it, they should consider. If you have not financially planned for it and if you don't have a massive scholarship, please do not take loans and send your children at undergraduate education. Even though 
there might be phenomenal opportunities. It will dent their financial future in a very strong way. So those are three very important parameters to look at. Don't force fit the you know one peg into the square. Um, look at academics. Look at personal maturity. Look at financial planning, and only then decide to embark on this. Even though there might be fantastic opportunities, perhaps you can do something in India first if this is not ready. And if the child is ready and you are ready, then you can go for graduate level. Because anyways, 95, 97 out of 100 people that leave Indian shores to go abroad are going for grad school. Undergraduate abroad is only a new phenomenon in the last 10, 15 years, right? So when, like I went in 97, 98, I, I was uh, the very rare kid, the undergrad from India, you know, on my college campus. Sure, sure. Great. Thank you, Neeraj. We are really over time right now by more than about 10 minutes, but really appreciate all the good things that you've actually mentioned today. Uh, we had a huge amount of students and parents today and the you know, questions just don't seem to kind of stop. But um, I am going to share your coordinates if you're okay with the parents so that they can reach out to you in case they have more questions or things that they may want to ask of you then. Uh, but really appreciate all your time. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you for this. And this was really one of our, uh, the most awesome message itself. Uh, Neeraj, if you want, you can just put your email down in the chat so that everyone has that in case um, if they want to kind of just, uh, you know, reach out to you in case uh, they have any questions. Um, uh, thank you, everyone, for attending this session today. Uh, we've got um, an, a session on artificial intelligence for tomorrow, which is being hosted by Dr. Uh, Jonathan uh, uh, from um, McKenzie. He, uh, and he's going to actually talk about the application and the future of AI tomorrow. So more than happy to have all of you back on the session tomorrow. It's at six in the evening. Uh, thank you, Neeraj, once again, and really appreciate your time. Thank you, Shaker, for giving me this opportunity. Um, it was great fun on a Sunday morning. And I hope we are able to do more fun things like this in the future. Absolutely, Neeraj. And I think today there'll be a lot of discussions between parents and students. You've really ignited a lot of thoughts. <laughs> so it's going to be a very good Sunday conversation. Sure. So let me just also just say it. I put it in the messages. The best way to reach me is to go to my website, which is neerajmandana.com. And you can go through it and see what I do. And if you'd like to meet me, there's a registration meeting request form at the bottom of it. Just fill that and my secretary will then get back to you with an appointment. So thank you so much, everybody. Have a great Sunday. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Neeraj. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a great Sunday. See you. Bye-bye.